everybody. I'm Fouad. Um, hello. How's everybody doing today? Good, good. Almost done. Almost done. It's been a good conference so far. Great. Cool, cool. I like it that. Good enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Uh, so, again, I'm Fouad. Uh, I spent about the last nine-ish years working as an Android full-stack developer. Um, various organizations, various locales. Um, Silicon Valley, Chicago, um, Florida, here, um, kind of in like Europe and a little bit in Asia. So travel, traveling around a bunch. <clears throat> um, currently, I work at Wayfair. You can't tell. Um, I work on our mobile platform team for Wayfair's supply chain um, team. Uh, I focus a lot on like the architecture roadmap of our product and our platform. <clears throat> so today's talk is going to be on Kotlin Redux for everyone. You're not in the wrong talk. You're in the wrong talk. So Wayfair, uh, you may have already heard, you may not have. What is Wayfair? You gotta start there. So Wayfair is an e-commerce company. Uh, it sells everything home. So people come to our website, they'll search through a long curated list of, of goods, whether that be furniture or accessories or whatnot, <clears throat> through our through mobile applications. They select what they want, they'll get all these items. Uh, they'll enter in some of their information, they'll hit the purchase button, and like boom, you've got furniture. It's great. <clears throat> from there, they get a bunch of uh, delivery updates from Wayfair, some coordination, and then you know, lo and behold, something shows up that they're set and they're happy. Right? That's that's ideal. But what does it take to actually get there? Um, the thing between hitting the boom button and then getting your stuff is what we call a supply chain. So let's dive into that just a little bit. Uh, supply chain is pretty much any uh, the logistic network needed to get an item from point A to point B. Let's say. So when it comes to brick and mortar stores, this is the um, uh, this is the process of getting an item from a manufacturer or a processor to uh, the store shelf. And then when, in the case of like Wayfair, this is about getting a furniture, getting getting a sofa from the manufacturer that built it to uh, your living room. Let's just say there's a lot of different components that go into this. Everything from uh, from the actual cargo ships and freighting across the oceans. It's built in Europe or elsewhere uh, to uh, the trucking, getting those, importing those those ships, trucking them to our warehouses, warehousing them, which means keeping them, storing them, <clears throat> to what we call kind of like the last mile, getting that from our warehouses to your door. There's also a little process of like getting it inside, but that's that's neither here nor there right now. What you may not have known is Wayfair. We have a vast, vast, large and expensive, uh, complex supply chain to make that process work. And what goes into it really stems from the, one of the first things I mentioned, where we have a vast catalog of, of things that you can buy, as well as different product profiles. So we sell everything from linens, that you can throw on your sheets, you can throw on your pillow, to spatulas, to sofas, to hot tubs, to gazebos, to giant elephants. Like we, we literally check our, pro, check our inventory, we sell everything, it's, it's crazy. <clears throat> But we have to operate a supply chain that can take take stuff from wherever it is in the world and then get it to your doorstep. But these things ship very differently, right? Amazon, a lot of their stuff is very small, so they can ship it, they can put it on your doorstep, walk away, they don't care. And, and part of the time, like we can do that too, right? If you order a spatula, we can leave it at your doorstep and, and when it gets there, when you get home, you can get home, you take it. <clears throat> but that's not how it all works, right? Sometimes you order a sofa, you can't just leave a sofa at your doorstep, right? If you have a walk up or something. Uh, it's not going to be, uh, it's kind of like a bad day for you to <laughs> take that upstairs. Because <clears throat> at the end of the day, what do you care about? Like, you care about having fast and reliable shipping of things that you order. You care about getting it on time. You care about getting it to your place. Make sure it's the right dang thing, right? Like, we, we care about that a lot. This is the key motivator in supply chain in, in the entire world. Buy a linen, cool, it's going to get there. I don't care if it's a little early, if it's a little late, it's going to stand on my doorstep. But if I buy a sofa, I've got to take time off. I've got to work from home. I've got to coordinate with some people to, to bring that up into my living room, potentially to, to build it for me. <clears throat> and then I need to make sure that I do it that day. If they bring me something that doesn't fit, if I bought a sofa and they bring me a table, my day is kind of so well, I need to do this again, right? I need to send it back and all that. It costs us a lot of money uh, as a supply chain, as a logistic firm, and it also costs you a lot of time, potentially money. And we're messing up your lives. We don't want to do that. <clears throat> cool. So, like, let's imagine this a little bit. Um, let's say 
you are moving on Boston's annual move day. For those who don't know, September 1st is, is move day in Boston. Um, the entire city is, is moving. 90% you know, of the city lives in apartments or something like that, some crazy statistic, and they're all moving. So you don't only research, you've got everything ready, you have 10 friends who are helping you move, uh, they're all ready, you've got, you've got a truck downstairs, you have all your boxes, everything, go, boom. So I'm packing everything, putting everything away, <clears throat> put it in a box, hand it to a friend, friend um, you know, slaps, uh, slaps some tape on it, throws it into the, into the truck. Do this all, record time, I've got everything into the truck. Close the truck, get to the new place. I'm in a new place, I start unpacking, I'm like, this box doesn't have a label on it. Well, hopefully the next one does. So lo and behold, no boxes have labels on them. You've got 30 boxes piled up in your new living room, and you're just like, what the heck just happened to me? <clears throat> that is the problem of warehousing. Let's imagine now, instead of those 30 boxes, you have 100,000 boxes. Just racks and racks and racks of just boxes everywhere. And like that, no labels on anything. Warehouses are a complex place. They are really complex. This is the root problem with both warehousing and inventory management. This is the problem that our team tries to take on. <clears throat> so not only do you have to keep track of this, but inside the warehouses, boxes can be touched and they can be moved by any number of people. You have no idea who, who put things there. You have no idea what's in a box. So you have to go into it with that understanding. People can move things with, with like a hand cart. They can pull things around. They can use like a forklift. There's tons of different operations that people can use to take boxes and put them in different places. <clears throat> But as a warehouse employee, my job is to get you your package and to get you the right package and to make sure you get it on time. Right? That's my goal. That's my key motivator. How do I do that if I don't know what's in there? So what we do is, is we have uh, we we decided that we needed to get mobile. So we needed to give people in the warehouses the ability to see what's in each product, to, to understand like who's who's ordering what, and um, to to give them the ability to put that on a truck and get that to your door. So. We first started, our first iteration was really successful, it was very useful, it allowed us to scan boxes, to do things, um, and to, to get to a multi-billion dollar company. Fantastic, right, it's great. But you kind of start to see, yeah, that looks like a little hard to use, right? That doesn't, that doesn't look great. And then you see what the UI kind of looks like, and you're like, oh, this is a command line type thing. I gotta do what? I gotta move these boxes where? This is, this is, going, this is crazy. Not intuitive, right? This is, this is, this is hard, hard to learn. Um, we have to train people on these things. So we've got a new employees come in, new employees go out. Uh, it's kind of like the world of warehousing. Um, so we have to train people. The longer it takes to train, the longer it takes for us to, to realize any sort of benefit from that employee. <clears throat> so that's first. And second, right, tiny screen. That, that text is really hard to read. That's zoomed in, by the way. That, that's maybe maybe like a three by three inch screen. So imagine that. on working around in like a hot warehouse, trying to pick up boxes that are 50 plus pounds and move them around, but that's not easy. It's hard to click, right? What is the, what is success on that? What is next? Right, there's there's some numbers and some keyboard there. It's like poor visuals. What, what, what are we gonna do? So our team is actually building an internal proprietary software, uh, proprietary tech to help make this more efficient and to improve our UX. So this is kind of what it looks like. Um, here is just like a basic login screen. Right? It's not like we're, we're changing user experience, but look at the difference between that screen and that screen. Right? Enter in your username, password, you select which warehouse you're in, and you get log in. Now, let's say you want to log in on the left. Which button are you hitting? Tell me. Which one do you think? The blue one? You're wrong. It's that little orange thing on the side there. <laughs> do you know how you know that? You wouldn't know that. That's the... So it's, uh, it's, it's kind of good, right? Like this is a smart room of people and we can't figure out which button to use right away. Uh, it's going to be hard when you have to deal with this uh, on the fly. So this is one of the main things I want you guys to kind of take from this is uh, the difference between an operational app, which is what we're talking about here, and a consumer application, which is what most of our lives kind of deal with. Consumer, I have a task I want to do, I want to boom, 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 bang it out, do the task, 10 minutes, I'm done. Close. I won't open this app for another day or something. Um, whereas an operational app, I have to use this application to work. If this application isn't working, I'm not doing my job. <clears throat> this application is open for 10 to 12 hours a day, give or take, depending on what they're doing. And if there's any slags, if there's any slow time, they can't actually perform. 
So one, you're not in, you're not realizing the, the monetary value. You're losing out on their salaries or whatever they're paid. Plus, the shipments aren't on time. They're not delivered. Customers dissatisfied. You might have to you know talk to them or, or spend more time with them. So that ends up being a pretty pretty bad situation. Cool, cool. So now you guys understand the basis of like what my job kind of entails with the user side. Let's talk about what we're going to do today. So today, we're going to dive into like our team's journey to go from that on the left to the one on the right. So one, one to consider making architectural changes. This is a problem that people ask all the time. Uh, today, we're hopefully going to solve, or at least give you some of the tools to help solve that. Two, what to keep in mind when making these changes. I think there's a lot of trade-offs that we need to do inherently as engineers, <clears throat> and just uh, good citizens, I would say. Three, I'm going to share our experience in, in what this process was, and got a long experience, so hopefully I have uh, some things you guys want to hear. And then lastly, some of the lessons learned. I screwed up a bunch in this process, I'm not going to give here and tell you that I'm God's gift to engineers, and that's not the case, uh, so we'll talk about my scripts. Cool. So let's get started. What is architecture? I think we need to define this before we can move forward, right? <clears throat> As developers, some of you may be, may not be, uh, but our job is to get is to take big, complicated problems, break them down into different pieces, and systematically uh, solve and improve each one of those little things. So, cool. Now, architecture is the pattern that we use to break down that problem. So, taking a big problem, breaking it down. That's what that's what I'm going to define as architecture in this situation. <clears throat> so, create one. And then you try it out, learn from it, you iterate on it, you do that process multiple times, you set it up as a standard, and that becomes a defining way of doing it. So let's jump into architecture. So first, we're going to start with MVP. You'll know what MVP is, it's pretty common. Yes, it's now. So this is where our journey starts. For those unfamiliar, MVP stands for Model View Presenter. This is what we use in our application when I started at Wayfair. Um, but generally speaking, it kind of breaks down into a model somewhat like this. Um, don't yell at me, it's kind of just a generic thing that I've been creating. I can't do that. Um, views in charge of the UI, pretty, pretty reasonable, responsible for doing things like rendering the views, updating the, and binding to the UI. <clears throat> the model is actually the data kind of backing it, usually speaking. Uh, the presenter is doing everything from talking to APIs, databases, whatever, and then um, marshalling that to the appropriate screen. In our case, we use it for navigating and things like that. So. Cool. Now we look at this and we're like, this is pretty awesome, right? We've got separation. I got my UI here, I got my data here, I got any interactions like over there. Like, cool. Like when properly followed, MVP looks pretty dang cool. You have your separation of concerns. Everything's doing one little thing. Like you sorry, didn't do that twice. Uh, we've got developer empowerment. Everybody knows what to do. They have the total autonomy to make changes should they need to. Sounds good in theory. And then great developer velocity. Like our developers. They've been doing this for a long time. They, they could crank things out. Boom, 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 boom. <clears throat> like, what is there to change? Like, this is fantastic. Let's just slow down a little bit, though. Um, MVP is far from perfect. There's a reason why there's talk after talk after talk about different architectures and, and the best ways to do it. See, so MVP ideally is like this. This is a theoretical. But in reality, and in my experience, we tend to see MVP morph into some sort of blob-like structure like this. Um, now this comes out due to changing requirements, uh, due to architectural changes, things like that. Different people work on different code bases, and they break things here, and things modify. It's kind of the nature of, of any sort of architecture. <clears throat> As the application grows in size, things change. Um, but over time, we can kind of see this is, this is actually a proportional change of what, what our system looks like. Our models are small, they got a little bigger, if you too small, you got a lot bigger, and our presenters got like gigantic. That's kind of the general MVP. And that's pretty much what you see in most cases. When you have MVP, you have tight coupling. You know, a lot of apps that I've been in part of. You also have God object presenters. <clears throat> These are giant classes. These are things where your presenters are doing API, database, view binding, navigation, any sort of server on this stuff, all of the above. And so you look at one of our presenters. Oh crap, that's a lot of code, right? I mean, that's 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 a lot. And then you look at it like, well, oh, actually that's inheriting from this base class here, so there's too much twice as much. And you're like, oh hey, we added a helper in here to pretty much just take code out of our presenter and, and just do it over there. But it's actually all the same code. And like, 
like, what's going on here? Like, a point on my hair is crazy. Uh, cool. <laughs> and you're like, what is our issue? Um, this is a problem everywhere. Uh, but but let's, let's kind of go back into like what, what our specific issue is. Our issue is, um, when I first joined the team, most of our most of our developers have been exclusively working in Java and Android. So, you know, we're at a Kotlin conference, so everybody kind of loves Kotlin, Kotlin and they want to learn it, and blah, blah, blah. I'm with you. I've been using Kotlin for at least the last two years now. But everybody, everybody knew Java. They were really good at Java. They All their apps before had more Java. I mean, Facebook does almost entirely Java. Uber does, like, most of Java, too, and a lot of big companies do. It's hard to migrate when you have code bases that large. Um, big point, though, is Java isn't actually a problem. If you think about it, Kotlin and Java are compiled down to the same same code that's run on the VM, right? So if something in Kotlin can be compiled down to something cool, you know, if we can do something cool in Kotlin, we can compile it down, we should be able to do the same thing in Java. But our limitation stems from Android, Java and Android. Um, you know, so up, Java, up to Java 8 support, Java 9 and above hasn't been, but Java is continuing to be iterated on. Um, so just keep that in mind, Java isn't actually the, the worst thing ever. Jake Warden, if you know him, he's constantly working on stuff with Java, suggesting new things, and, using the latest stuff for some of the side projects. Another issue that we face is some duplication. It's a lack of issue, lack of reuse. As I mentioned before, our developers are really good, they're really, really intelligent, they can crank things out really fast. It's almost faster for them to duplicate code and rewrite it and go boom, boom, boom for muscle memory than it is to abstract it away, use kind of like a base class, and then you know, inherit things properly, which means that anytime you need to make a change and it's cross application, it takes a lot, a lot of time. A lot of time refactored, and a lot of time to do that. Uh, one thing that's kind of inherent to our application, because we are an operational application and not a consumer application, our apps open for 10 hours at a time. Most consumer applications can't say that. So our application has to deal with memory issues, it has to deal with like resource usage constraints, <clears throat> and it also has to deal with um, the occasional Android clobbering application problem. So I had never been I've never heard of this. I've been working in Android nine years. Never heard of this happening ever before. But uh, essentially, I don't know the root cause of this, but what was happening, our application being open for a long time, Android would deem it not useful. It would close it. It would take the last application that we did initialize, take the intent, take all the bundles associated with it, and then it would recreate that. The problem for us was we kind of did stuff on that page. So you know the intent wasn't actually doing what we wanted it to do. It was kind of like old. <clears throat> so this was a, a really nuanced problem where we had to, okay, understand Andrew's going to close us. We need a smart way, intelligent way to bring us back to where we actually are. This kind of gets into like caching and initializing from caching. How do we properly save our state? How do we come back from that? Because save state is only going to be as useful when, when you're doing it when you expect to, when you expect a state to be lost, right? A save instant state. But if that's not being called because Android clobbers you and you're kind of like SOL, um, this brings on an idea called item potency. So how many of you guys know what item potency is? Uh, David, cool. uh, for those of you who don't know, item potency essentially is the idea of applying an operation um, from one to n number of times uh, and having the same result after the first time. So let's let's use an example. <clears throat> let's use a box example. So if I take this box and I put it on a shelf, um, what do I want to do to save that box to the shelf? Like how am I how am I Logistically saving that. I could do a count on the shelf. I could say that that location now has another another box on it. Well, if I want to redo that action to make sure I actually did it, if I do it again, the count's actually updated again. So instead of having a count of one, it now has a count of two, and three and four, et cetera, et cetera. It goes on and on. <clears throat> That's not going on. We don't have five boxes on the shelf. Like we can't do that. Uh, so what ends up happening, and, and for those of you who are familiar, this is the textbook world kind of like transactions. We want, to, we want to save the state. So we want to say that box, okay, your state is now this location. And in this location, your state, you have these boxes in it. So you can do that n number of times, and I can say I can update that state for days, nothing's going to happen. I'm good. Cool. All right, so we talked about impotency, we talked about some of these problems. Now, do we fix each one of these problems that we have in our current architecture? Do we try, do we try something out new? This is the, this is the question. So before we can actually answer these questions, we need to identify like what do we need? Like what is what is important for our application going forward, both in the short term and the long term? Again, this is the question we need to answer. Uh, main things that people think about are like involvability, like unblocking, 
us in terms of development, both in the short term and the long term. Cool. So what is it that we need? First, uh, it's coming from me mostly, um, the team kind of like talked about this. So we want single responsibility. Having, a, having an idea of performing one operation, having a single piece of code do a single thing, means that that thing can be done once, left alone, and just composed together with a bunch of other little things. Um, we can unit test it, and that for evermore will be set. Second, modularization. We want things to be componentized so that we can take them and we can put them in multiple places should we need to, and we can also have different people work on them without affecting other pieces of code. We want some, we want some reusability, right? We don't want to create everything from scratch. And lastly, that you know, the golden rule of development, we want faster development velocity. Everybody wants faster development velocity. <clears throat> so we've got our goals, what are we doing? Where are we going from here? Let's go back to our problem, right? Like, are we fixing the problem or do we try to use a new approach? Well, let's discuss what that means. So if we fix each problem, uh, that means that we have the current code base. We don't have to re re recreate everything. That means that we could potentially evolve it a little bit for our future. But this is going to feel like a patchworky kind of solution. Am I just throwing stuff at this MVP framework just to make it work for our situation? Or do I try a new approach? Um, this can be pretty expensive. Uh, do we want to rewrite everything? How do we do that piecewise? Is this going to be slow? Is it going to be fast? Is there a way to do a little bit of both? Like, can we find a way to take our current implementation, take some parts of the new implementation, and move forward? Well, it turns out that, in my experience, a little bit of both kind of is the way to go. Um, we want to take what we have, we want to take MVP, and we want to take, take a look at all the other architectures, see which parts of it that we like, see which parts of it that we think can be useful, and slowly add one by one into our place. Cool, so now we're going to try both. How are we going to judge that? We're going to use those exact things that we just defined before. Right? Pretty simple. So we're a single responsibility, we're going to modularize reusability, faster development velocity. And who are our contenders in the ring? Uh, so we started with a lot of them. Uh, we had, uh, we pretty much devoured the internet looking for different architectures, looking for everything that people had done before, uh, all over. And then we came down to four final pieces. A lot of debate, a lot of conversations about this. So one, we keep our current model MVP. Second, we do MVVM, which is very similar, uh, but more an Android-specific thing. The model being view model. Um, thank Android for that confusing name. Uh, then you have Viper, for those unfamiliar, view, interactor, presenter, and entity, and, um, forever. And then MVI. It's been like the talk of the nation, the model view intent, essentially like an event stream that you can send things to and send things across. So these are four ones that we're thinking about POC. So let's start with MVP. So we covered this a bit, I won't get into it a little bit more. You know what MVP stands for, how are we going to judge it? So let's go through it. Single responsibility, in theory, yes. There's some hand waviness going on. We just talked about how this is a problem before. We fix it now, I want to make sure it's not going to be a problem in the future. Modularization, yes, in theory, same thing. Reusability, same thing. Faster development velocity, hopefully. We're adding a lot of changes to it. Does that slow us down? Does that speed us up? I don't know. Um, one POC, is it really going to tell us what we want to know? MVVM, um, so model view, view model, take view model, or take the presenter, switch with the view model, you pretty much have MVVM. Uh, it's, it's really uh, heavily being pushed by, by Android, and by folks at Google. Um, view model is actually lifecycle aware, so it helps you with a bunch of stuff. We're not going to get into the, too much of that. <clears throat> How are we going to judge this? Well, it's going to be pretty much the same as MVP, right? It's going to have a lot of the same positives, a lot of the same negatives. Uh, one of the things to call out though is a view model is inherently backed by, by Android, so it's a Google specific class. So if you want to do some testing or if you want things to be separated out from the Android lifecycle and or from the Android ecosystem, test them separately, you don't have that capability. Right? So a presenter is just a class, whereas a view model is actually taking from, um, from an Android component, so you need the SDK. Um, faster than velocity, yep, there's tons of code samples out there, whatever. So we'll get into Viper a little bit. Viper, again, uh, view, interactor, presenter, entity, and router. Uh, our counterpart consumer application at Wayfair uses Viper, so we had a lot of, uh, so we had a lot of resources to take that, a lot of um, exposure there, so we could talk to some people on the other team. So how are we gonna judge that? Similarly, single responsibility, well, things are inherently a little bit more split out, and NT is kind of like a model, I'm just using it loosely here, and you me. Um, an interactor is kind of like our API database, like interacting with any sort of like side effects that we have. 
<clears throat> so you look at it and you say, okay, well, modularization is kind of inherent in this architecture. Everything's kind of separated. Single responsibility, same. Reusability, maybe. Our, our consumer application kind of has problems with this. Fast development velocity, maybe. Again, our consumer app sometimes has problems with this. People don't know what to do where. <clears throat> then we move on to our last one. MBI. So model view intent. It's a unidirectional data flow. Everything moves in one one way. Has many different options out there. Uh, a cool one, Mavericks by Gabe Peel over uh, used to be at Airbnb's uh, Tonal. Um, really cool. I recommend you guys check that out. We looked at that. Didn't exactly meet our use case. It was a little bit too modular for us. That's a thing. Um, then we kind of also looked at the Redux. That sounded cool. It's a pretty light architecture. So we're like, hey, let's let's try that. Let's give that one a shot. There, the story starts there. What is Redux? So, it was built by Dan Abramov. I don't know his name, sorry. Hopefully, you know, don't, I'm not butchering it. He's really smart. Check this guy out, look him up on Google, uh, see his talks, look at his blog post. Uh, brilliant guy. Um, Redux is used quite often. It's a, it's a functional architecture frequently used with React on the web. Uh, so, places like Facebook and things like that use Redux with their React on their front end. Uh, it is a predictable unidirectional architecture, unidirectional flow, uh, built using pure functions. So, me. Pure functions are just functions that, sorry, similar. Pure functions are just, are just functions that you can uh, perform m number of times and get the same result. Kind of sounds like high potency, keep that in mind. Uh, and it's a single source of truth. Fantastic, right? Like if you have one truth and you know everything stemming from this, that's great. Wait, wait, what, what did I just say? What, what are we going over here? Uh, well, it kind of breaks down to this. So Redux is really known for having three three components. There's a store, which maintains your single source of truth. It's your state. Um, it's a state with a wrapper around it that emits events, essentially telling you anytime you had an update. Uh, there's actions, which are all the events that are fired from any sort of user interaction or any sort of background interaction. And then there's reducers. Reducer is the only thing that can take uh, the actions that are happening and then your state combine them together, marry that, and output a new state. That, that is the only way to update your state. I like it. There's a fourth, it's called middleware. Um, we'll get into middleware in a little bit, but it kind of does what it sounds like. Cool, so uh, here we have our diagram. Sorry, this screen is a little, a little uh, dark, but the action has an arrow pointing to the right, to the reducer. Uh, so all actions go to the reducer. The reducer is going to get the state, it's going to get the action, it's going to output a new state. The state the store is going to take it. It's going to say, hey, I've updated. That update is going to go to the view. The view is then going to say, hey, cool, I've updated. Um, or any user actions on that, it's going to launch a new action. So it's, it's, like I said, uh, it's unidirectional. It's always going in one way. Um, and then here we have middleware, and then we're like, oh, we see it make an API call. So what middleware, middleware really is, it kind of boils down to, is it's going to intercept all actions that are being emitted from our UI. And they're going to perform some sort of side effect operation. These are things like database operations, shared preference uh, communication, things like API calls like we see here. Um, anything that is going to be asynchronous and not necessarily bundled uh, within our application. Part two. So now with Redux, we've essentially taken all the mutable state that's living in various parts of our application pulling that all into one place. So we're taking all the mutability, pull it into one, we have this one state that's not actually mutable. There's only one thing that can, that can update this. So you've, you've now left the rest of your application to be stateless. Keep that in mind, pretty important. Transformations are rerunnable. Now that we have actions firing, one way of updating the state, we can now say, hey, I know exactly what actions led to what state updates, and I can, I can play that back. Now I have the ability to to see the history of all the actions, the history of all the state updates, and then to use that to help debug and triage any issues that happen in the field. So, you know, like I said, we are an operational application. If anything goes down, we need to fix it right away. We need to <clears throat> make sure that, that we are not losing money by having an app down, or having people slow down. Any slowdown costs us money. So if we can see everything that they're doing, if we can see all the ways that, that we're updating our, our application, we can, we can fix that faster. Cool, so we just got through, and now we've got the Redux, and let's look at what the how are we judge this. What does our POC email look like? So single responsibility, well hopefully we kind of see like there's an action that does one thing. The reducer, it's just gonna take a state and an action, and it's gonna do some some uh, business logic to it. It's gonna help in a new state, doing one thing. 
Um, same thing goes with uh, with Miller. It's going to take in an action. It's going to see, hey, I'm going to call an API, or I'm not going to call an API. I'm not going to do a thing, or I'm going to do something. One thing. Um, and then you have your store, which is going to maintain, it's a data object, it's going to maintain your, um, your information. Reusability, pure functions. Pure functions are the definition of reusable. Uh, you can do them n number of times and get the same result. That is reusability. Uh, faster development velocity, shrug. Uh, who knows if that's going to be the case, right? Like, uh, it's a new architecture. Uh, I could try it on a POC, but I can't tell you if that's going to make you faster. <clears throat> all right, so we've gone through all four of them. Now, how do we get everyone aboard? So, first and foremost, we have a small team. We now need to find out, like, everybody has to agree. If everybody can't agree, then we can't move forward with this. And our default, our fallback, is to keep our current architecture. So we know that. So everybody must agree. We've got to get products signed up. We're going to move to a new architecture. That means development's going to take a lot longer to go do the first time. I almost forgot I was holding that for a whole period of time. Um, so product sign up. You need to make sure that, uh, that they sign off on a little bit of slowdown that you can see to try things out if you're gonna if you're gonna work on that. You need to have an implementation plan. There needs to be a detailed implementation plan of how you're going to want to start going down the road with this project. Um, how you're going to, to migrate things over, backport things over, and then how you're going to further uh, develop your architecture and your platform as you <clears throat> and there needs to be onboarding. So going along with the implementation plan is you need to make sure that you set yourself up with guardrails that new developers, new engineers coming across from different teams have the ability to come into your application and can be successful, can have the documentation and the resources that they need, excuse me, that they need to be um, to hit the ground running. And the winner is surprise talk called Redux. I mean, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know how to tell you. So, uh, so we picked Redux. Cool. Now what? Uh, we, we've gone through this whole research, and we're like, we're going to change our architecture. What do we want to do? Well, we want to change our language, too. Like, let's just throw everything at this thing. Uh, let's just make sure that we have the most hectic uh, experience possible. Um, lesson learned, don't do that. <laughs> cool, cool. So why Colin? Um, we're, at, we're at a Colin conference. I don't know if I need to really go over this, but uh, one supports both functional object-oriented programming. All of our code previously in Java was object-oriented. We wanted to migrate over to a more functional paradigm, where instead of things being necessarily like locked into classes, things are, are pure functions, and we can use that to compose uh, into uh, building further and further more complicated uh, processes and features. Higher-order functions, we can use that. We can use pure higher-order functions and or consolidated, um, consolidated functions to pass uh, across borders. So that way you can you get pass a function that only knows about its parent and pass it to a different class that has no no idea about what's going on in your initial class. Um, very, very powerful. Functional types, um, Java didn't really have this, at least Java 8 didn't have it, and we were still stuck on like Java 6 or Java 7. Um, either's, tries, and options. We focus on railroad oriented programming uh, on our application and our platform. So this means when we have a success, we pass that success all the way across. When we have a failure, we pass that failure all the way across. So we need to, we define all of our failure cases, we define all of our success cases, we make sure that they're handled in a code. So part of our architecture pattern, we make sure all developers handle all of those cases. It's not a try catch we don't, we don't allow that in our code base. We make sure that you define every single one of your code, um, every one of your options, and you handle those. And less code, same result, right? Um, not going to go over that, but the, the last one that we talked about a little bit briefly, quickly updating. So if Java's not updating, but Kotlin is, um, if you're going to go with updating versus not updating, it's a pretty easy win. Last but not least, uh, kind of lied about that again. Android loves Kotlin. Kotlin's first libraries, Kotlin first development. Uh, can't say anything more about that. So let's get to coding. Cool, we've gone through this whole journey. We talked about supply chain and blah, blah, blah. Now it's like actually get some code. All right, so how do you want to implement it? What is your implementation plan? It starts with the foundation. What can I do to set myself up to then incrementally roll this out? So let's start with what their classes look like. So this is an action. An action is just a serializable. The reason we want the serializable instead of parsable is because we wanted this to live outside of the Android world. We can test this separately. We can entirely contain this outside of Android. And it's just going to pass a type. Very simple. This is our interface for reducers. Uh, it's a little bit harder to read right in here, but uh, it's just going to take a state, it's going to take an action, it's going to output another state. 
pretty simple. We have a store, uh, which is going to implement a dispatcher. So anytime it updates, it's going to dispatch a new event. It has a state, S. Um, it's going to have subscribe, so anybody can subscribe to it if they want to. It has the ability to replace reducers. So your store is actually going to be the one maintaining references to all the reducers. So anytime you update, um, so anytime a reducer finishes, it's actually going to update the state internally to the store, so only the store has a reference to it. What that means in the, in the end is your store actually maintains the bus that is the unidirectional flow. So your state handles all of that. We have a lot more comments and a lot more guardrails in place, so we define, like, hey, how do we use it, what, what different scenarios to work in, uh, but I remove that just so, so you guys can even read it easier. And the last thing we talked about was middleware. So middleware, again, was that special occasion where you have a store um, in that state, you have the dispatcher that you care about uh, passing it down, and then you have the action. This is where you can perform an API call, and then you can respond to the action. That's cool, right? Um, I lied a little bit again. Okay, you guys aren't gonna blame me after this. It's a line, but, uh, there's another type of middleware called an epic. So if you look at a Redux, uh, there's, there's, it's a very specific type. It's a middleware that's designed to do asynchronous operation. So you can have middleware that does non that can do synchronous operation, but you want you want a middleware that can also do asynchronous. So like a reserve pool. If you make an API call, you're not going to respond in that right away. You may want to return like a loading state. You may want to return a success and or error state. Different types of actions. Um, and to do that, we wanted a reservable type. So we used Epic in this situation. So now we got our foundation. Let's use it. Let's create a reducer for this class that we have. Oh crap. <laughs> Whoops. This <laughs> happening again. Oh gosh. What does this look like to you? Yeah, yeah, it looks like a god presenter. Um, well, what's the solution to this? Turns out, again, Redux has been done before. Uh, there's a composite reducer that you can use to uh, take a bunch of different reducer types, to compose them together, and then to simply um, marshal that data to those reducers. It's a very powerful concept. It allows you to do things like this, where you just define them separately. Um, this is my entire class, and then let's dive into like fetch result reducer. That's the class. It's handling four different options, and we need this more and more, get bigger and bigger. But uh, again, there's there's definitely ways to mitigate that when you have a composable architecture like this. So we have what our reducer looks like. What does our state look like? Our state's pretty much anything. This is just a data object. It has anything from primitives to collections to um, other object types to you know, dates and other complicated uh, objects. As long as you have some way of serializing them, um, it's fine. Cool. Here's an example action. So you define those as sealed classes. Again, we wanted to do real world oriented. Every single action must be handled. So all of these actions are defined in a sealed class, which when you switch over, you need to handle and you can, you can get to all of those. All right, so we've just implemented our first Redux component. And now what? So let's look at some of the results that we have. We went through that process, we, we created a new foundation, um, a new workflow, we added to our application, and let's look at kind of some of the results. So when I first started back up in April and March, we were 100% Java, and now, like a week or two ago, when I was writing this, uh, we're at 50% Java, 50% Kotlin. Pretty cool. There's definitely some learning curves with that push. Um, what's the right way to do this? You know, why have both Redux and have Kotlin? What's the right way for me to do that? Keep that in mind. Um, the way I handled this was I documented this into a Google Doc. Anytime somebody asks me a question, I have an FAQ. I put it as part of our, our GitHub page now, so so anybody coming in can, can answer that, and it doesn't live in anybody's uh, brain. Is there a Kotlin way to do something? This is probably the most frequent question I get. Uh, being the only one who really worked on Colin a lot before I got there. Uh, our team picked it up really, really quickly, but again, they still have these questions from time to time. How do I do this in Colin? Uh, it's pointing them at the docs. Let's talk about Redux, right? Um, so we started with the foundation, but one of the main things that we did was we had everybody on our team involved with the building of that foundation. Hey, there's, we saw Redux is actually really simple. There's three classes that you care about, right? The four if you count the middleware, five if you count the epic. So five classes that you care about, you can, you can write that from scratch. It, you don't need to have any library to do that, you don't need anything. So what we did was, um, anytime you're building a project, you want to really promote ownership. You can give that off, you, you, can, um, you can 
you can ask different people on your team to, hey, can you try doing this and let's, let's see what we can do. And that really gets a lot of buy-in from your developers. It gets them really engaged with what they want to do with, the, with trying to build this platform. So once we started the foundation, we added a different workflow. So we added a new workflow, which is great. <clears throat> this allowed us to really test it in production, no longer POCing it. Um, okay, what are the good, the bad, and the ugly? We ran into a lot of issues when we were doing this. Hey, we didn't think through this problem. Hey, we didn't think through that. For example, the, the reducer, like our reducer got really big, really fast. Our epics got like really big. We added Kotlin coroutine support, and we really knew how to do that. Like these are things that, that kind of happened just we were putting out fires as we were developing, and that was a big mistake that I had made, was uh, not really being conscious of that decision before we started. So looking back at it in hindsight, I would have really developed this first, maybe given them an initial, hey, here's some mock way that I would do this, and let them move forward. Uh, slowly extended that to specific actions. So we added some middleware to do like analytics. Anytime we fire an action, it's going to probably get on the forward. Uh, pretty, pretty, pretty useful or is probably my favorite part of Redux. And then we unlocked a lot of development. So now what we can do as a platform team is we can stop developing different workflows and we can develop just the platform, maintain that platform, and actually offload the development of our workflows to full stack teams that don't really have Android. We just tried this last week um, where I handed this off to uh, a different person to, to try a new workflow. They were able to build the whole thing without touching any Android code and they did it in only a couple days. So it was a really powerful um, example of how our architecture would separate things out enough and was easy enough to pick up just from the code without any real good documentation. Um, so I was, I, was, I was really pleased about that. I think our whole team was really excited. So continuing with that, middlewares are awesome. You know, they have the ability to intercept everything that goes through, perform actions on it. We use that again for like logging, for reporting service, for things like analytics, et cetera. <clears throat> Separation of concerns is huge. Uh, it allows us to really test things out in our, our code coverage has gone up from about 60% to about 80%, um, which is great. It's including with Android. Like, we're able to build on top of MVP, so we're not actually like totally pulling out of MVP. We've actually just incrementally added to it. <clears throat> we've customized it for our use case. Again, we've added to MVP. We're incrementally adding on and on and on, and then slowly like backporting that. And then our team uh, work to build that foundation. Once we have the buy-in from the team, there's really nothing else to stop us. Cool, so some of the lessons learned. POC wisely, uh, one of the mistakes I made was that POC was something a little too easy, and we did that across the board. POC was something more realistic, something more real-world. Um, probably goes without saying, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Incremental improvement. We didn't build Redux from scratch for a totally new thing. We took what we had, we put Redux to the side, and we slowly started building something on top of it. Like if we now have an MVP Redux kind of hybrid, it's good because MVP has good roots, but it, you know, in practice it really just inflates. So this helps us, this helps us alleviate some of that pain point. <clears throat> we can still you know, maintain things like data binding. Communication is key. Make sure people understand. This is that problem I was talking about with like Kotlin coroutines and, and things kind of getting jumbled because people didn't understand. If I had set something in place and I made that, I didn't make that mistake, people would have been able to develop a lot faster and without so much of the problems. Uh, the devil's in the details. Uh, this, again, kind of generic, but it, it goes into a lot of what we talked about before. You need to make sure that you understand what the domain is, like, hey, we are an operational app. If you're not handling resources and you do it wrong the first time, that's going to get copied. People are going to reuse it. You need to make sure you handle things really correctly, get really in the nitty gritty if you're not able to do architecture and our future state. So we want to move to a UI that we can use as like a state-based components. Uh, this was something we learned at a talk by some folks at Netflix, where they use um, components that are composable that can be built on top of each other. They will actually emit all the actions, so they don't need to know about anything else. They plug directly into your architecture. <clears throat> and so your view doesn't actually need to know anything about them. It just says, hey, I want this component, this component, this component. And you can kind of build them that way. It allows you, again, to remove the need to have Android knowledge. And then to automate some templating. I think uh, that's something that in Android we don't have enough of. We do copy a lot of code to recreate things and recreate things. Um, but if we could automate some of that, that would be really useful and save a lot of time. Increase development velocity. 
Cool. And in wrapping, we're done. I promise. I promise. Do your homework. Uh, really research it. We, we looked at 20 plus different types of architecture before we decided like a final board to do POCs with. Try not to waste your time with too many before you get that. Um, prove value. So the easiest way to get buy-in from product or whatever is to, to make the case before you even walk into the room. Okay, we proved our value that, hey, we have some, enough separation concerns, we get enough database, or we get enough testing, we've extracted enough Android away from our coding process or coding library, <clears throat> that it's, it's almost, uh, it would almost be foolhardy not to go down this path. And the product was, didn't really even have much of a say because we made the choice for us, for them. Learn from my mistakes, talked about them, I don't want to keep bashing myself. Um, and don't be afraid to try something new. Kind of generic. Cool. Wait for hiring. Yeah. Go to the online and get some people around. And questions. Questions. What? There you go. Green line. Hey, so we use, um, we do a sound of React Redux for web development. Um, and I was really curious to see how you were going to use Redux for a non web, like non browser based environment. Did you see other people making mobile apps with Redux? Yeah. So before I'd actually started at, um, before I started at Wayfair, I'd actually been working on a Redux app for um, like four or five months prior. So I had some experience I learned from uh, Michael Pardo. I don't know if you know him, but he's really, really smart. He introduced me to it. Apparently other people have been trying it with FBI and other things like that. Um, really powerful, is you probably use React. It doesn't take very much to use it in Android. Again, it's about how you solve the problem and going from an imperative style of programming where we just go through, like, hey, I want to do this, boom, 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 to, okay, let's, let's not think about it top down, let's think about it from, from a high level and break that problem down differently. So that's taken a little bit of time. Question? Another one? Sorry, I'll take it away. Uh, how did you think the Android views just react to the changes in the state of the store? That was my question. Gotcha. Gotcha. So that actually takes a little bit of work, right? Not, not something out of the box. So um, all updates from the store actually get released as observables. So we, we would listen to those observables and then we propagate that through like virus binding or something like that to update the UI. It's actually not very, very complicated at all. In its inherent form, Redux is very simple. Um, MVP is actually a little bit more complicated than Redux. People just aren't very familiar with functional programming and part of Redux is functional. So that's, that's where the, the mental block comes in. Awesome. Well, I thank you, and thank you, Wayfair. I mean, you guys have been a generous sponsor, and it's been a great place to have these talks. Good job. Cool. Thanks, guys.